as you uh, can see, so in this talk, I'm going to introduce uh, first uh, my research context uh, covering uh, the notion of user-centered human machine uh, systems and also the research background about active recognition and the behavior analysis in smart health care. So uh, follow that, I will uh, introduce a hybrid approach to computational behavior analysis. And then uh, we'll uh, outline a, a number of computational beha behavior analysis related research activities and the project. And uh, finally, I will probably uh, discuss uh, future research uh, directions and uh, summarize, you know, uh, potential uh, areas. So, so first, probably uh, uh, let's uh, <clears throat> let's uh, take a look at the you know traditional human machine system. So, which is normally referred to closely integrated uh, human and system uh, machine systems, uh, which actually are quite common in our daily life. As you can see uh, from the uh, left hand side, you know, the, the, these pictures, which include uh, uh, a human uh, uh, operators uh, operating a crane, a car, fly a, a plane, or using simply a mobile phone or medical devices. Yeah. So as uh, you can see in the right hand side, the abstract conceptual uh, depiction depic uh, uh, depict you know, this uh, traditional human machine system. And in this context, the, the role human played is mainly uh, as a operator or controller. You know, the human operator observe the effect or consequences of the machines and also to the environment and that exercise, you know, control <clears throat> to the uh, machines. However, this has been changed, yeah, with the uh, emergence and uh, development and the uh, large scale uptake of the pervasive computing, uh, internet of things, you know, mobile and the distributed computing um, as you can see uh, in the right hand uh, uh, pictures or diagram, so the role people played has, has changed. It's not only as an operator, but more as an entity to, to be served, you know, for either the user experience, you know, satisfaction and the well-beings, you know, you can see it's the machine observe and serve the users. And the machine observe the behavior and how the user react to the services and then take a control, you know. So that is uh, uh, what we are now talking about, you know, uh, anywhere, anytime computing, context awareness, you know, personalized or adaptive or anticipatory you know, services. So such uh, uh, application scenarios, as you can see, include you know, applications in smart home, smart cities, and uh, uh, many you know, intelligent transport or smart energy. You know. Some probably examples you may not be aware, even say in our daily life, like you, you, you wear a smart watch you know, Fitbit, you, you use smart speakers and all type of online recommender systems. Yeah. So we, we think this is, the, we refer to this as a notion of user-centered human machine systems. And this notion can be probably uh, best characterized and depict in these three words views as you can see here. So um, I think from, from this, you can see probably observe three main characteristics of the change. Yeah? 
One is the uh, ingrowing separation of the physical world, you know, sensors, actuators, smart object from the cyber world, you know, the web, the cloud, the edge. So the computing capabilities is more, more, not say they are all embedded, integrated in one machine. Yeah, this is one. The second you might notice uh, the, the change of the evolution of the interaction and the communication yeah, between these three entities. So it's not only human, you know, physical operating these devices. You can use gestures, you can use voice, you know, all different type uh, multi-model uh, interaction uh, technologies. And the most important, I would say, probably you notice the human now in this uh, picture or in this context now become the first class citizen. It's not to say just an operating machine, but actually it's a part of the whole system. Yeah. So as, as a result, user and user behavior and uh, interactions require explicit and formal <laughs> representation with this you know, new, probably I would say type of the user-centered human machine system. Yeah. And this new will bring a, a whole raft of new you know, research questions, issues, and challenges. So as you can see here, say you know, how human machine systems better serve the users, how user and the system interact impact each other and who are uncontrolled. Yeah. And clearly there are issues, you know, you want to a uh, machine or service or probably more posh world, you can say use app or services. You know, I think the key is how can they understand what a human is doing or they are thinking. So that brings up research issues about computational behavior analysis, user and the system modeling, and interac interaction modeling and the system dynamic. Yeah. The challenge, probably you can see, among the three world, is not then static. Each world itself actually is evolved. You know, technology is going, hardware, software, you know, humans understanding also changing. You, 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 you need, you want, you know, you for a particular application also it's changing. So um, on top of that, you know, for different application, the human behavior is different. So this brings the whole new challenges to this research. In this a backdrop, uh, my, I and my team probably in the past decade, have been working on uh, assistive living and smart healthcare in smart home. Yeah. So probably this is the best uh, application scenario for the user-centered human machine system. So the idea in the smart healthcare within a smart home is to deploy you know, uh, ICT technologies like Internet of Things, sensors, and uh, data analytics uh, systems. So to monitor what an uh, inhabitant is doing in that environment. And uh, that could be the physical activities or vital signs of healthcare, yeah? Or the uh, physiological parameters. By analyzing them, therefore, the system can provide support for either like uh, independent, uh, independent living for people with uh, mental impairment or support, you know, self-care, self-management for people with uh, chronic disease. And also more and more we are care about the well-being, you know, like uh, early risk detection about mental health, you know, depressions, anxieties, stress. So it's a cover all different aspects. So in this context, our focus focuses on 
activity recognition and behavior analysis because we know only when uh, the system can figure out what its uh, inhabitant is doing or how his or her behavior change that they can provide best services or support. So in this context, when we, we, we say, you know, activity, we refer, normally we will say activity of daily living. As you see, they are basic uh, ADLs, like uh, making meal, making drink, uh, dressing up and down, hygiene, you know. And there is another type of called, you know, uh, activities we call instrumental uh, uh, ADL. That is refer to the use of technologies, housework, you know, take medication, uh, financial, you know, uh, your, your own financial management. Yeah, no matter what type of activity. So there, we need to distinguish uh, uh, from, you know, activity recognition from uh, behavior analysis because they are has subtle differences. Yeah, for activity recognition, the purpose is to decide what an uh, inhabitant is doing. Yeah. And uh, this is very useful for supporting independent living, you know, or context where we see uh, timely support or assistance. Behavior analysis is different. It's aimed to decide how an uh, activity is performed yeah, by a particular or specific user. And to detect the patterns, a particular ADL is performed over a long period of time. The logic behind that, as you may be aware, you know, lifestyle is becoming increasing, increasingly, uh, increasingly important in healthcare. So by monitoring the behavior change, you know, it could provide key markers for the uh, for the change of your health or well-being if you have some medical conditions that may also indicate it you know uh, it's become better or worse of the situation so there are different uh, level uh, of uh, research and also serve a different uh, a purpose before we discuss uh, our research probably just clarify a little bit of some background yeah so uh, activity of daily living, you know, there are uh, many different ways they can be performed. As you, you see here, there is a single inhabitant, you know, sequential uh, activity of daily living, basically means, you know, I, a uh, uh, inhabitant or a uh, person uh, pro take, you know, perform one activity only when he or she finishes that and then he will do the next. And there is also a scenario, you know, single inhabitant, but he or, he or she uh, perform interleaf, parallel, or concurrent activities. And then there are more complex uh, scenarios like multi uh, inhabitant, and they joint perform sequential activities, or each of them perform independent activities, or they uh, collaborate with each other, uh, jointly perform uh, uh, multiple activities. Yeah, so you can see uh, it's just uh, uh, reflect the different temporal or spa uh, uh, spatial constraint in this process. Yeah. The second, uh, probably just a highlight here, our research is mainly focused on single user. Yeah, but it could be a, a sequential or it is, uh, we also address interleave parallel or concurrent uh, activity recognitions. And another background I would like to mention here is there are different ways you can monitor yeah, uh, uh, the activities. So there are region based monitoring, use cameras. And then there is a wearable sensor using wearable sensor, you know, attached sensor to the human body, uh, measure uh, directly either medical vital signs or 
you know, uh, uh, other uh, kinetics, uh, you know, uh, signals. Therefore, you can infer activities. It is normally used for, um, you know, ex monitoring exercise, uh, like walking, running, or sitting up or down. Yeah. Uh, another is non-vision based uh, monitoring. Basically, we uh, apply uh, ambient sensors and deploy them in the environment. Yeah, so therefore they can monitor the movement or the change, you know, location or the uh, the the object the user or inhabitant interact with, and through the interactions, then they try to infer. The activity. So there are this is a different ways, and our research mainly focuses on using both uh, wearable sensors and uh, ambient sensor. So that's just give you uh, a little bit of background of our research. So with this background, I think the uh, research question uh, for you know in our research is um, given a uh, given a uh, real time data stream from multiple sensors in multiple form, you know, uh, how to infer the activities being performed. So you see this uh, 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 data series from uh, multiple uh, sensors. So probably we, we humans, when you, know, you look at somebody, go to kitchens, pick up a cattle, and get a, a cup and uh, take out a teapot, you can infer, oh, that a person is going to make a cup of tea, yeah? And if you, you see he opens the oven, take a tray, you know, you, 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 you could guess, oh, he, well, he might want to do cooking. Um, but the machine don't have this knowledge, yeah? So to do this, the first step, Naturally, we say we need to uh, model this knowledge and uh, tell the machine that is the what activities. So, modeling activity of daily living is uh, probably first step. You know, providing uh, computational models. Yeah? The second is machine. You need to give, we humans have the cognitive capabilities. Uh, we can infer, we can do reasoning, you know, based on multi-source informations, we can infer so what the situation is or what will happen. The same, we need to give the machines of these reason, reasoning capabilities so that they can, uh, based on the, uh, the uh, received uh, observation or sense uh, sensor data and then do the uh, uh, inference yeah to derive what activity uh, a user is performing and then you know the behavior analysis basically focus on long term so we recognize what a user is doing today or we recognize what he or she is doing next time or next week and over a period of time, we can observe, oh, did he or she change the way they perform the activity? Surely, you know, it will, you know, just like you undertake any task, when you become familiarized, you will do it more quickly, yeah? But still, to some stage, it will be stabilized, yeah? But what is this final stabilized uh, 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 way you do something? That is what we want to know. So uh, just a quick uh, 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 introduction about the background, you know, there are different ways uh, for activity recognition. Basically there is one is based on data mining and the machine learning, yeah. So uh, this is a, uh, probably the main approach, yeah. And this approach, there are two main type of method. One is, called uh, generative modeling and recognition like Hayden Markov uh, uh, dynamic based network and POM DP. And another is uh, discriminative modeling and recognition like uh, nearest neighborhood and the support vector uh, machine and decision tree. Yeah. But no matter 
you know, they have a different method, the generic methodology for data-driven active report definition is more or less the same. Basically, uh, you create uh, you create the probabilistic or statistical active models, and then you learn the active models. Basically, you 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 change the parameters, yeah, and then you use the active model as a classifier, yeah, for activity recognition. More or less, this is the way you know high level generic uh, methodologies. The advantage is the method you know for data driven is able to handle uncertainty and temporal uh, information, but also it suffer uh, the code start problem because it require large scale pre existing data set. There's also other problems you, you see, because when you learn the data model, only when the data contain what is happening. Yeah? If the data set does not contain the information, the knowledge, you will never learn that. Yeah, that's one. Another is you learn something from one particular user's data, but you know, we all do things differently. So the model you learn from user A may not be suitable for user C or user D. Yeah? So that is a, a problem for data-driven uh, activity recognitions. And there's another uh, approach we called knowledge-driven activity recognition. It is based on knowledge engineering and AR, AI techniques. Yeah? So again, um, there are different ways. Yeah, different ways. So, but the generic methodology still we can summarize more or less. Yeah. So in this uh, approach, we acquire domain knowledge and heuristic about activities, and we specify activity model directly use knowledge representation formalism. Yeah. And then we develop reasoning mechanism and or reasoning engines. So in this case, performing activity recognition is more or less through formal logical reasoning. Yeah. Of course, because we have a different knowledge representation formalism. Yeah, you, we can use first order logic, we can use action event theories, we can use you know description logic. So each different knowledge representation formalism has corresponding you know, the way how do you model knowledge entities, how do you do representation and the reasoning. Therefore, it will leading to different implementations, but that is the uh, implementation details. But the high level principle and the methodology, I would say more or less is the same, yeah. For this approach, you know, uh, there is uh, uh, advantage, you know, there is no code start uh, problems. Yeah, we all know, for example, how do you make a cup of tea? We, do, we all know how to prepare a pasta. Yeah, why do we ask a machine to learn it? We know we, how to do that. Yeah, why do, you know, especially in the healthcare domain, it's very difficult to collect large scale data set. Yeah, another uh, 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 probably uh, uh, advantage for knowledge driven approach because it's based on logical inference, you know, it is semantically clear, yeah, in terms of modeling and in terms of the conclusion you draw from the logical uh, uh, reasoning. That's easy, you, 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 you think about the uh, tractability and the soundness of, you know, uh, uh, not traditional knowledge based systems. But of course, they have, uh, uh, they suffer from. Uh, you know, a disadvantage, you know, people will complain, how can you generate, you know, all active models, you know, it's static, it's rigid, it's uh, how do you handle uncertainty, you know, that, that's all different uh, uh, problems. So uh, we have, we try to marry the advantage or strengths of the two approach and meanwhile, you know, to mitigate the disadvantage. So in this case, we propose 
a hybrid systematic approach to computational behavior analysis. So uh, comparing to either data-driven or not driven approach, our approach, with our approach, the modeling is not a one-off activity, but a iterative multi-phase uh, process. And the modeling recognition and the behavior analysis are interwaved, yeah, both conduct and improved uh, incrementally. So the approach can be uh, depicted in this way, you know, suppose we have a smart environment, you know, uh, with a, a human inhabitant living in this environment. We first apply a uh, knowledge-driven approach, type of knowledge engineering. We can build uh, 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 activity models. We know we cannot cover all activities. Therefore, we do not expect the active model is complete, yeah? But it doesn't matter. We know it's incomplete. Therefore, we call it a seed active models, but we will learn the models and to incre uh, incrementally you know, increase that, yeah? So that is uh, uh, the first stage. Second stage, once we have the seed active models, then we can use uh, uh, this logic, you know, reasoning inference to recognize the activities based on the sensor observations. Again, because we know the model is not complete, therefore we do expect the active recognition result will be, you know, contain two types. One is recognized activities. Yeah, uh, we call it labeled activity traces. Another, another is unlabeled activity uh, traces. Basically, so because that activity has not been modeled, the machine does not know that. Therefore, the machine cannot recognize that. We, we admit that, no problem. We collect these two set of data. Yeah. And it's in the third set, third phase, we apply machine learning techniques is here. So at this stage, we will apply the machine learning to learn the new activities. Yeah, it's a pair the user performed, but it was not in the seed active model. We also want to learn how suppose you know uh, uh, activity activities are recognized in our labeled active traces. We can learn how a particular user perform that activity, yeah? So that is similar, we learn the user's profile. And again, if we, we do the long-term data analysis, this phase, we can also analyze how a user perform a particular activities over a period of time. That is the user's behavior, yeah? That's it, that is changed, you know, from three months ago or half a year ago, et cetera, yeah. Once we learn this, then in the fourth phase, we can uh, update the activity models, yeah, and also increase the uh, user profile. And this process will iterate, yeah, until, you know, there's no more new activities can be captured and the new uh, user profile are fully established. Yeah. So if we look at this uh, uh, from work, so the first two phases is basically not driven. Yeah, it's a force on activity recognitions. And the second and the third phase is data driven. It try to improve the model and also to derive the behavior. So this uh, uh, is uh, uh, from work, we have been working in the probably past uh, 10 years. So you may notice there are uh, some papers uh, in the slides, uh, basically that's the work we published. Um, so in the past decade, more or less, for each of this process, you know, different technology component, 
we have carried out corresponding research. So I will uh, quickly uh, go through this, yeah, uh, all different type of research. So the first, probably uh, very quickly, uh, we, we will create a uh, seed activity models. Yeah. So uh, we conducted conceptual uh, co context modeling. Yeah. So activities happen in temporal spatial dimensions related with various contextual information, you know, sensors, objects, items, you know, your cup, teapot, uh, kettle, that is the object you use, yeah? And uh, in different locations, in kitchen, or if you have a uh, hygiene, it may happen in bathroom, yeah? So there are also temporal informations. You do something in the morning, you do something in the evening or midday. So they are all interlinked. So we create a, a conceptual uh, context model, the first, and then we uh, we conduct conceptual activity model. You know, no matter if you think about what uh, active daily living, they always link to different location, object, timing. Yeah. So uh, how to perform that? What are involved? Yeah. So that we explicitly specify the relationship between object and activities and build a hierarchical structure to encode the relationship between the activities and the object, also including the activities, yeah. And then we uh, create a computational uh, activity and uh, context modeling. That is where we generate the first uh, seed activity models, again, uh, in this case, we use ontological en uh, engineering. Yeah, I'm not sure you know, we use a portage uh, uh, tool from work to encode all this. And therefore we generate uh, activity concept class. Yeah, that is a generic activity models, but we, all, we can also generate the instances of each classes for a particular user. And that is a particular way a user perform a particular activities. So that represent uh, the profile of that user. Yeah. So that both them are fed into the system for, for active recognition It's the phase two, yeah. So when we come to the phase two, we perform activity recognition. Uh, I think here um, you can see we uh, we need to first segment different sensors. Yeah, so we analyze the different char characteristic, you know, of the streaming uh, data series. They are you see here there are different scenarios. You know, fixed size, no overlap, or uh, dynamic sizing no overlap and then you see dynamic sizing with overlap and then there is a sliding window which can shrinking which can expanding to adapt to the uh, you know the uh, data streaming in as the data streaming in yeah. and on top of that we develop a non uh, tupel uh, time window models and then we uh, um, you have an algorithm, you know, this is just, uh, this is published in a separate papers, um, but I just give you, that is what we uh, did for uh, data, sensor data segmentation. Once we have the segmented data, so when we have uh, the active models and we capture the contextual data and uh, we model the activity on our ontology. In that case, uh, active recognition is equivalent to uh, uh, concept classification. Or more using the discrete logic term, it's like a subassumption reasoning. Yeah. So if you look at this, uh, you see this is a, a activity classes and this is the properties, and this is the range of uh, types. And when you interact with the object and the sensor attached to the object will fire, and then it will map 
to the different properties of the active class. Yeah. And then uh, you, you, you use the semantic reasoning uh, and it can derive you know, uh, which class that activity description will be corresponding to. So that is the way you we apply uh, subassumption reasoning to perform activity recognitions. And our uh, approach will work in real time, you know, uh, perform continuous uh, progressive uh, uh, activity recognitions. So as you can see here, as uh, activity unfold in a timeline, new sensor data come in and it will be dynamically segmented into different chunk. Yeah? And within each chunk, the data will be mapped to the properties of our activity model, like an uh, ontological uh, concept. And they form a, a, a activity description. And then we here perform a sub assumption reasoning that we can recognize, as I mentioned, it could be a recognized activity, which could be a non recognized activity if the model has not been covered. And this process can be repeated. Yeah? So, therefore, it can uh, support uh, continuous uh, progressive activity recognition. Um, so this is the second phase. And then we, once we, we do this, it's moved to the third phase. Yeah? And uh, as you can see from the last slides, you know, from the second phase, it will generate two data sets. One is unlabeled activity traces and uh, basically uh, activity which happened, but which has not been modeled. Therefore, they cannot be recognized. And the second is labeled active traces, which is recognized activities. Now, it's the third phase. We will apply uh, data mining machine learning uh, techniques to learn. Yeah? For example, you can see here, the first we want to learn from unlabeled active traces to learn the new activity. Yeah? Here, you can see uh, from the diagram, there are different. So the, uh, there is a, a subset, uh, data set of unlabeled active traces. We will define uh, semantic, uh, uh, we define semantic uh, similarity metrics between you know, uh, unlabeled active traces and we compute similarity between all those uh, um, unlabeled active traces and then classify the, those active traces into subset. Basically, each subset corresponding to a new activity, but does not mean that activity is a regular activity. Then we will calculate the frequency of the activity occurrence, and then we will decide, you know, based on threshold values, whether or not this is a new activity. You know, based on that, we will expand the models to improve the completeness of the active model. So this is a, a, a algorithm. Yeah. Again, for the labeled activity traces, basically for those recognized activities, you see here again, uh, they are in a data set and then they are uh, partitioned to sub data set. Yeah? And we will uh, define, uh, we define again, a similarity matrix between you know, different labeled active traces, uh, we basically transform uh, a vector of object signatures because when you capture is basically uh, uh, object the user use, you know, uh, map to the sensor. So we uh, construct a vector of object signatures and then we use uh, uh, Pearson similarity algorithm to calculate that. We computer similarity, and uh, we then classify the active traces into subset. Yeah, basically each subset corresponding to a uh, unique patterns a user perform a particular activities. Yeah, again, uh, after we calculate the frequencies of occurrence, we can uh, de decide whether or not this is a pattern. 
or is a unique way, or simply say, if it just happened once, it's just a random occurrence. But if it happened every, uh, all the, you know, 80% of the activity occurrence, then that's maybe the pattern the user normally do things in this way. Yeah, that's form part of the user's profile. So this is uh, basically acquire the profiles yeah, to prove the model quality. So that will support when we talk about personalized services, what we mean personalized because we based on that person's uh, specific uh, way of doing things. Yeah. So after the two and then once we can identify, you know, recognize activities, then over a period of time, you know, we can learn uh, uh, how the user perform an activity. Yeah. So that will involve calculate the frequency of occurrence of activities, yeah, to decide if activity is a regular activity. And then uh, if it is a regular activities, again, does it have a activity patterns, a unique way it, it is performed. So probably I'm not going to details here, I just described you in particular in a smart home context, how do we participate a day into different time slot. And then we monitor the starting and timing of activities. And then we do the analysis and extract the patterns. Yeah. So roughly that's the, a uh, uh, third phase. So we, we, as you can see, we combine uh, modeling is a first phase and the recognition second phase and behavior analysis and the model perfection in the third phase. And in the third, fourth phase, basically we will uh, decide you know, to enhance the active models. Yeah. So to decide uh, uh, where the learned activity will be added in the ADL ontology or model and decide the labels, the name, you know, the learned activity. But in both cases, human validation is needed for quality control. Yeah? And again, uh, we will uh, create uh, uh, user active profiles based on you know, the result from the uh, learning the labeled activity traces, yeah. So learn the unique way or patterns a user do something. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will not go to detail. So we have some, uh, we implement our prototype system as you can see here, uh, uh, how our uh, demos uh, mass slides probably just, so this is a, a, a smart lab. We have uh, conducted the various research uh, and here probably is, uh, let's see, uh, a, a demo show you uh, experiment of activity recognitions. So um, I'm not sure whether or not here, uh, you can hear the uh, sound, but uh, sound does not matter. Mainly probably you can see uh, all those sensors are attached, you know, simulate to uh, attached to different object. And when uh, when a student touch one sensor, you know uh, it it simulate you know uh, the user interact with the object. So that is uh, as you can see uh, how the system you know uh, uh, will do the collect all the data mapping to the uh, ontological entities and perform the inference, and from which you know it derive uh, the different type of activities. Yeah. Okay, um, just to give you a, a, a taste, uh, I will not uh, stop here, uh, just uh, be aware of the time. Yeah. So um, we, we do the testing evaluation. So, uh, so that is the, uh, probably you can see we list a number of papers, you know, that's uh, that's the uh, result which support that uh, these papers. So, uh, 
uh, now probably I uh, introduced the uh, systematic hybrid approach. Uh, now I'm going to uh, quickly go through a number of activities surrounding um, behavior analysis. Yeah. So uh, the first, uh, probably each slide, each slide may be a, a, a research publication. So I, I will not be able to go to detail, just to give you a rough idea what's the purpose, what's the aim, you know, what to do, what have we done, you know. So this probably is mainly focused on complex active recognition, you know. Progress, what we talk about is mainly focused on single user sequential active recognitions. So this one, we focus on uh, uh, active recognition, you know, for interleaved concurrent and parallel activities, which we use uh, combining the distribution logic with temporal logic. And as you can see here, we extended the uh, uh, original active model uh, with temporal inference. Yeah? And then we, because it's a parallel or concurrent, that involve multiple activities. So the K is a temporal relationship between you know, different threads of activities. So uh, again, you see here, we, we use ontology to characterize uh, the different uh, sensor data activities and uh, uh, create uh, inference rules. And uh, we implemented this in a multiple agent system. So there are a single activity recognition agent looking on individual thread of activity, you know, um, sensor uh, uh, series, you know, streaming data and how a collaborative activity uh, recognition agent will uh, coordinate different uh, thread of you know, uh, primitive activities based on single activity recognition agent. So that is the way uh, we, we, we do that. Uh, another, again, we expand the research. Uh, here we focus on fine grained activity recognition using fuzzy logic. Uh, this is to try to address uh, the cost grained activity recognition drawback. Because when in progress, we say the activity recognition is based on user and object interaction. So the assumption is you attach a sensor to object. Once the sensor fire, we assume the object is used. That is uh, uh, what, but for some, uh, there's no evidence to confirm that is the case. Yeah. So for example, you want to pour uh, some hot water into a cup to prepare the uh, tea or coffee. How do you know the water is, is in? Yeah. So in this research, we combine uh, description logic with fuzzy logic to model unprecise Unprecise data. Yeah. We then apply multi model sensing for single object. So you see here, uh, this might see, uh, this is some prototype uh, built up in, in our lab, you know, for, for each single object, could be a cup, a kettle. We, we attach uh, three sensors yeah, uh, to, to measure, for example, the temperature, the level of liquid or uh, the, the angle of you know, you pouring water. You know. So this is uh, show you the, um, uh, I think the interface of the portage. We, we use the, uh, I think a fuzzy logic, fuzzy DL plugin to the portage to specify these rules and then develop a, a, a inference uh, uh, algorithm. Here probably give you a more uh, clear examples. You know, say we want to detect a uh, fine green pouring actions with a kettle. So you see here we uh, we attach three sensors. You know, one is liquid, one is temperature, one is gyro scope sensors to this, and then when the data coming in, it will segmented, and for each segmented data set, you see it's the top. 
will collect three sensor data. Yeah, one is about uh, liquid level, another is object temperature, another is uh, gyroscope will represent the angle, you know, the, the, uh, the point. So for them, we first do the falsification, basically attach, uh, um, attach and map them to the values. And then there is a fuzzy rules which will do the inference, you know, and uh, when the rule is met, then, you know, you, you can uh, under, uh, recognize the, the, uh, the activities. So, uh, Luke, um, Luke, would you be able to summarize in a couple of minutes time? Yes, okay, I, I can, yeah. So- um, Appreciate that, we, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we have five minutes, yeah, okay. Um, five minutes is okay, Sajal. Okay. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, probably uh, another uh, study surrounding the behavior analysis is about sleep behavior analysis. Here, you can see one is we perform a sleep position recognitions. We deploy sensors in different parts of both human bodies. And then we, we use active graph. Uh, we try to uh, analyze sleep wake stage analysis. You know, that is uh, one. And here we try based on sleep behavior to de derive uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the potential disease, try to correlate uh, sleep quality with the disease. Here we first on, we have a data set from uh, I think the US National Sleep uh, Research Resources. So we, we correlate uh, the sleep quality with you know, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, and the sleep apnea. Yeah. We also, uh, uh, my team also carried some research on actually learning uh, behavior monitoring using uh, e, uh, EEG and eye trackers. You know, we try to, uh, in this uh, specific uh, uh, study, we try to identify, you know, if our old learner, what is the learning style? Does he prefer visual information content or does she or him uh, prefer Wobble, you know, so that is the uh, eye tracker and uh, uh, EEG uh, uh, data, and this is uh, what we process. You know, we use the principal component analysis to process the EEG, EEG uh, data, and then we apply. Uh, we use the uh, uh, estimate, you know, uh, uh, the box plot from the different channels of EEG to extract the features and apply the SVM uh, classification method. Yeah. Um, we have also a, a number of uh, project on this uh, sphere about you know, computational analysis. One is uh, mobile uh, muscular skill user self-management. So probably I will not go to details. Basically, you know, if you suffer from arthritis and you can do self Management monitor at home uses the wearable sensors and they collect data and they analyze data. So that is a, a collaboration with Norwegian uh, Research Council. Another uh, project is uh, also about the activity recognitions. So that is, you can see patient centric uh, models for remote uh, management, treatment, and rehabilitation for autistic children. So basically, we want to move the assessment and the therapy of autism children from clinic environment to home environment. So here you can see we use uh, videos and, uh, and cameras to monitor the, uh, when the children give a video, a game to play, we monitor the brain activities and then we will analyze that and the key feature here you may see is provide three different interfaces for family members, uh, uh, therapists, and uh, clinicians. Yeah. Um, the final one is probably just uh, is an ongoing one. We try to apply the behavior analysis to the cybersecurity context. So as you can see here, uh, we want to go through you know, multiple alert in a in a network. 
we want to uh, uh, perform data mining to uh, establish the situations, basically from alert of multiple intrusions, but many of these are false. Yeah, and then how to reconstruct the act, uh, attack scenario? Then from the situations to establish the responses. So that both uh, tasks are, are, are addressed in you know data and knowledge uh, hybrid approach. So I think roughly that's what uh, um, um, we have been working on computational behavior analysis. So just a, a, a quick uh, summary. So we think our, our, our CBA is a key to smart user-centered uh, human machine systems. Uh, our focus is on probably smart healthcare, but I would say it's useful for more broader applications. Yeah so-called smart applications in smart cities like that. And the hybrid approach is promising, but I think it's still at an early stage. And uh, most importantly that, you know, when you recognize activity, that is only first step. It's not the whole story. So, so what when you uh, uh, recognize the uh, uh, activity, action you know, activities or the behavior change? Yeah. I would think the our future work probably partially focus on unobtrusive uh, long-term behavior monitoring and the freestyle activity recognitions and the probably uh, multi-behavior data fusions and analysis method. Yeah. Probably another is how can we combine uh, knowledge driven with data driven to provide uh, semantics for later stage you know, we talk about decision interpretability or explainability. So that is what we uh, our focus at the moment. So uh, thank you for you uh, uh, listening. Uh, um, so Sajal, I think, uh, sorry about yeah. two minutes. Uh, thank thank you, line. let's thank uh, <laughs> Professor Lining Liu Chen uh, for, for a wonderful talk, uh, a multitude of different things, application of uh, sensors, IoT, and data collection monitoring in a smart health context, and how to even inject the behavioral monitoring into the solution process. So very much socio-technical research, which is very important in today's world of uh, technology. So it's time for questions now. Uh, and Lining, I'm sorry that your captions, I could not, and looks like it is from your end, because when I speak, nothing shows up. So something yeah, I, I, you no, can I figure just, out uh, later. Uh, yeah. But I, I tried, I, I could not that. figure out. But anyway, so let's uh, <laughs> uh, have some time for question answers, Q&A. Anyone who has question, please ask. Yeah, Ardendu, you have some question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Chen, for the nice talk. My, uh, I'm not very familiar with this, but I'm interested in um, smart health applications and how we could sort of use the wearable sensors and other kinds of sensors to that. And I guess uh, part of your uh, talk here is saying that you have some knowledge-based uh, activity models, and then you refine them on a per user basis, uh, based on the traces that are then collected, right? Yeah. I wonder about the scalability of the approach though. Is it not true that you would need a new model for every person? And secondly, like in smart health applications, is it really critical to know that whether somebody is making tea? I am not aware of the particular <laughs> use case scenario of your case, but just your thoughts on it. So um, uh, uh, for, for the first question, so I think your question is about our scalability. Actually, we design, propose the iterative process exactly want to address the uh, scalability problems. So as I said, we know we, we cannot cover all uh, permutations you know, of different ways of perform activity. Even just one person, you know, uh, you know, so many activities, uh, you cannot predict. So um, that's the way we say we produce initially based on not an ontological engineering, we can, or from primary domain knowledge, we build a seed uh, activity models. 
And then later stage, once we collect the, basically like, you know, just like a data driven <coughs> approach, you base from the, from the pre existing data set. And in our cases, we already probably have a good start. We have some seed incomplete X models for you to play with. You still generate the data set, but we, with this seed active models, we are able to you know, uh, separate you. Therefore, we, on top of that, we do further processing. So um, yes, so that's, uh, that's the way we will address this problem. And we believe we, we can achieve that for this. Uh, sorry, I did not get uh, the, the point of your second question. Yeah, no, sorry. That was like, it was just uh, active, comment. Active, yeah, activity recognition. I understand the uh, question, but I was wondering in case of a health scenario, like, is it like, is it critical to understand, for example, whether somebody is making tea or whether they are just cooking? Oh, okay. And okay. I see. I understand. I understand. No, um, in, in, in healthcare, care, uh, what we talk, you know, the digital health, there are many different use scenarios. Uh, one, what we talk about independent living. You can think about people uh, for with Alzheimer or dementia. The biggest problem for them is in the study room, I'm thinking to prepare a cup of tea. When I go to the kitchen, I forgot what I'm come here to do. When they, they prepare, they say, I want to prepare a meal, no matter lunch, dinner, they may open the cook, they put some tray, but they forgot, oh, what I'm going to do next. This is a scenario, say, uh, uh, like prepare, you want to make a cup of tea, make a cup of coffee for those people, it's difficult because the, the for people with Alzheimer's the dementia, the big problem is the loss of memory. They lost the track what they you know they want to do. So that is a, uh, that is one uh, scenario. You know, say want, we want to monitor and then provide context aware or timely assistant. So if we know, if you think about a C team in a in a presentation, monitor the elderly, 78 or 85 years old, they do something or they say, oh, you get, uh, you, you boiling water, you take a cup, you take a teapot, but you are, seems get nowhere, that system can remind him. So that is a scenario, yeah. And the other scenario is like, say, uh, you know, there are different usage, you know, like the, I mentioned the arthritis taste is say a patient, for example, su suffering from arthritis. Uh, they, the case is that they have already been diagnosed, diagnosed and become stable, but they become whole. They, they, they need to rehabilitate at home. Normally, they need to every week, they need to go back clinics to talk to the uh, clinicians to report back. But with this IoT or sensor, you know, at, at home, they can manage uh, all those uh, uh, parameters, a uh, system will record that, and the data will be relayed to the clinician. So that's the, the way is they reduce the number of visits for the patient to the hospital, and also provide a more timely monitoring and the suggestion. You know, it's not, you do not need to wait seven days or two weeks to see a doctor to report I have this, I did not feel well here, I did not feel there. You know, the, the, the daily, the self-monitoring will give you all this information. So this is uh, roughly the scenario and uh, the context. So Luke, you answered it very well, but let me just elaborate a little bit of Ardhandu, having worked in this area. So in this, in this case, I think dementia, cognitive health is the key, right? So question is, if you go through machine learning of the daily activities, you can get the confusion matrix. Are they getting confused, right? Are they doing sequence in a out of order, which might lead to an anomaly and maybe fire hazard? For example, they're supposed to make a cup of tea. Uh, they put the kettle on the burner without even putting water. And that could be a hazard, right? So question yeah. is, that means their cognitive ability is not matured enough or is not correct. 
to do things. So some of these activities actually give those type of symptoms that what are anomalies you do you see? Do, do they get confused? As he said, they go to the cupboard to bring let's say kettle or a cup, uh, tea bag and they forget and they come back again and they do that multiple trips, right? And you can observe these things, you can learn and create the confusion matrix and see the anomalies, right? That's number one. In your first question, I think was very good. So although for every person, the way you learn could be different because everybody's activity and context is so different, right? So first of all, you can give the personalized solution because you learn, but you can do the abstraction in which you're collecting these time series samples of their activities, but everybody's lifestyle has some pattern that you can learn, right? Although it is a personalized solution, you may think that, but your, your model is not independent for each person. You have an abstraction of the model, right? And you're learning that model, and depending on what I observe, I actually predict what you might do or how you are doing things. And for somebody else, it could be different, right? So, so basically we can develop the learning and prediction based models uh, based on abstractions. Basically treat these as symbols coming from as examples, right? And the symbols, once you go through that symbol, which will be, you can do information theoretic approach, you can text text processing approach, you can do mining, all sorts of different things. But you want actually personalized activity detection because everybody's activity sequence is different. Everybody's way of doing things is different, right? So it's possible. Other Thank questions, please. Hi, <laughs> so I just located the, <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the Zoom, you know, just try to figure out how to delete the subtitle is still there. <laughs> right. So later you can see, because from my end, I tried to do a few things. I could not uh, disable yours and ours are not getting recorded. So I do not know exactly what it means, right? When you share yeah. the information, whether it is your stuff, which is getting, uh, but, but yeah. I'll also look into it later. I did not want to jeopardize the presentation, right? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. the first time I had this come yeah. to this problem. Be I have one question before I ask that every, for everybody, yeah. there are two <clears throat> very important talks. One on Friday at 11 o'clock, I put on the chat by a very senior person from HP Labs. He's, a, he's an IEEE fellow, uh, also a senior fellow of HP, also a chief engineer, very prolific uh, speaker also, very nice speaker. Uh, and he's going to talk about the rise of cyber physical human systems at the crossroad of domain data and domain data and data sciences. So this Friday at 11, a different Zoom link, please attend. Next Monday, we have a speaker from at and Research and that is on uh, intelligence for cellular networks. The same time, 10 o'clock, same Zoom link. Uh, so Monday, 10 o'clock and this Friday at 11. So please do attend. Uh, I have a question, uh, Luke. I think you have done a lot of interesting stuff, right? It's, or it's not just one or the other because you have the activity recognition, sleep monitoring, all sorts of different things. Uh, do you find any common framework to deal with all of these things or these are all point solutions in silos for each of these problems? Um, I think as uh, a probably you, uh, at the moment, I would say um, data-driven approach probably still are the mainstream of the work. Probably majority of people. Um, uh, <clears throat> but in the data-driven, uh, do you find some common framework? Either a mathematical model of the framework that, uh, let's say for sleep, you just tune it this way, optimize this way for activities. I'm just trying to think whether one has to come up with different types of solutions Although no, I, I, have... I, no I, I would think, uh, Sajal, if you look at the, you know, we, we apply to learning style, learning and uh, behavior, uh, behavior, sleep uh, behavior analysis, uh, it's all use a different uh, method. But the, I think the generic methodology does not uh, differ significantly. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. But each application, or uh, the domain has its own, you know, uh, uh, feature, characteristic, uh, nature of data. So therefore, uh, I, I would say the, the, the method that we, we do need to do, uh, uh, to find the appropriate method suitable for that particular uh, data type, uh, I would say that. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Did you want to say something more, Lip? 
No, no. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, you you might have the same probably. I I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. The point is basically this time series data may have some mathematical characteristics. The question is whether you can exploit in a data and analytic domain, and for different application like sleep versus activity versus dementia, they may have some characteristics, but in terms of analytics, but again, like we're trying to see whether some mathematical invariant can be derived or not, which will cut across different applications. That, that is, that's the way we are looking at it, but it's challenging, very challenging. But another way, um, I'm, I'm not so sure, um, uh, because we now talk about, um, in our side, we are a little moving towards uh, cognitive analysis. Right. You know, not you know, uh, not just from the database to right. uh, you know, uh, step by step. Uh, so the key we, we are thinking, how can we uh, solve the interpretability right. uh, uh, a problem by embedding more metadata or semantics or meaning to the either features or you know then we can carry on that. And then we should provide, provide you know, the, uh, I'm not sure, a meaningful uh, uh, explanation when we come to a specific conclusion. So that's right. uh, what we, we, we are thinking. You know. any, any other questions? None, did you have a question? I, I did not know whether you are trying to ask a question or something. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Okay. I okay. actually uh, don't have question, but I okay. like your talk. Thank you. No, the talk was very good. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any, any other question for Dr. Chen, or Professor Chen? Um, I think uh, the, the, the talk is quite a high level, such uh, as I see. Probably each slide, you know, every two slides, you know, there is a paper is about that. Right. So, yeah. But, um, but the talk has been recorded, it will be made available. Uh, yeah. So people can actually go over, they can read the papers and also. Yeah. Yes, but do feel free to drop an email if you found right. you, you need a while, you know, more. Uh, and, and usually we also, we have a colleague actually who makes this as a YouTube version of it. And our departmental YouTube channel is MSTCS. Okay. I'm putting, putting actually the YouTube channel uh, on chat. So it's very simple. Uh, all the presentations, seminars have been put on the website, so on the on the YouTube channel, so everybody can actually take a look and yours will be also there eventually. So it may be okay. by this weekend. Usually Monday's talk, we put it in the weekend time frame. So by next week, you'll be able to see your talk on the YouTube channel in our departmental link. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Luke, thank you so much. I know it is uh, past five o'clock in UK. Uh, Northern Ireland. So thank you very much for, for a lovely talk. It was very, uh, I think, uh, comprehensive and really appreciate that. Mm. Okay. Thank you uh, to give me the opportunity to share right. the research. Sure. Yeah. And now I put a little uh, note on the chat box for you. Uh, you might want to take a look. Mm.